The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie McGee with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's presentation, Behavioral Link, ABA, APS, and Mental Health Working Together, being presented by Stephanie Colhane. Before we get started, I would like to share a little bit of information. The APS, the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by the WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC. We work with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. The APS TARC works with the National Adult Protective Services Association, or NAPSA, to present monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, and managers and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you would want to attend. Registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and would like to receive the registration information. A copy of today's slides is posted under the handout section in your GoToWebinar control panel and can be downloaded from there. You may use computer audio or your phones to access audio for this webinar. We ask that you please mute your phones, headsets, or computer mics unless you are speaking so that we can eliminate any background noise. If you, are, if you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and re-enter. This is intended to be an interactive discussion, and there will be opportunities for questions and comments during the presentation. However, if you prefer to submit your questions or comments in writing, you may type them in the questions box at any time during the presentation, even if we have moved on to another slide and your question will be relayed to Stephanie. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date. We will notify all attendees via email when it is posted online. Everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. Now we want to run a quick poll to get a feel for the makeup of our audience. My colleague Andy Capehart will launch this poll now and you can vote by clicking directly on your screen and making the selection that best corresponds to the profession you identify most with. Andy? Thank you, Leslie. So we've launched that poll and it's up on your screen right now. Um, just click on the category that corresponds the closest to your profession. And the question, of course, is which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Do you consider yourself an APS professional, an other social services professional, a medical professional, a legal professional, or do you not really fit into any of those categories and you'd consider yourself other so we'll leave that open for just a few more seconds to give everybody a chance to vote. Um, looks like the, the votes are coming in right now, the answers. Leave it open for just about 10 more seconds. And we'll then close it out and share the results with everybody. So I'm going to close that poll now. And it looks like overwhelmingly 81% of the folks today are APS professionals, 13% are other social service professionals. 2% consider themselves medical and 4% other. So thanks for responding to that poll. I'll turn it back over to you, Leslie. Go, oh, Leslie, are you there? We can't hear you if you're speaking. And yes, I was halfway through Stephanie's introduction, so thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Stephanie Giangrande Colhane. She is the BH Link Healthy Aging Liaison. Stephanie has nearly 30 years of experience in elder care and human services. She is a graduate of Roger Williams University with a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and a concentration in Forensics. She began her work in elder care at the Cranston Senior Center when she was just a teenager and has since worked in a variety of settings as a director of activities, case manager, prison discharge planner, nursing home social worker, and community relations coordinator. Stephanie's experience as both a protective services case manager and nursing home social worker has given her a firm background 
to assist the state's Office of Healthy Aging and BH Link when helping people over 60 obtain the help they need in treating behavioral health illnesses. I am now turning this over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Leslie and Andrew. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I first want to um, caution everyone if you hear barking, that's my dog, Tessie. She wanted to be a part of this. And if you hear lawnmowers, um, it just so happens that the lawn guys decided to show up right when I was logging on to this. So I apologize for that. Um, but thank you all for taking time out of your very busy days um, to join me for this presentation. Um, I was a, a protective case manager for about five years um, working in Rhode Island. Um, I was the lead protective case manager um, at a community action agency through our Division of Elderly Affairs, which we now call our Office of Healthy Aging. So seeing that 81% of you on this call today are protective case managers, I understand the work you do. Thank you so much. And I understand that during this last year of COVID, your work did not stop. Even if you were not able to be out in the community doing those home visits, some of you were, I'm sure, your work did not stop just because um, COVID sort of put a damper on being able to do that important work. So be gentle with yourselves and thank you so much for the really important, difficult, and sometimes thankless work you do. Um, so let me welcome you to BH Link. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, BH Link is a partnership here in Rhode Island with the company that I work for, which is Horizon Healthcare Partners. Um, Horizon Healthcare Partners is a conglomerate of five community mental health agencies here in Rhode Island. Those community mental health agencies work together to partner to provide better health care to our uh, partners here in Rhode Island. It's also a grant that is funded by BHDDH here in Rhode Island. And in Rhode Island, BHDDH is the organization that heads up state's mental health care. Um, and Community Care Alliance is a member of Horizon Healthcare Partners, and they are actually the organization that runs the BH link. Horizon Healthcare Partners holds the grant with BHDDH, but Community Care Alliance um, have all of the um, case managers, clinicians, peers, and community mental health workers that actually work at the BH link. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, what is the BH link? So again, as I said, we're a five year grant program. And what BH link actually is, is an emergency triage center. So for a lot of people, when you think about emergency mental health care, you'd think about going to your traditional emergency room, okay? And if anybody has ever gone to an emergency room for a behavioral health crisis, um, or if you know anyone that has, you know how daunting that can be. It is a really difficult task um, to go to an emergency room. First of all, it's difficult to admit you've got a behavioral health issue, whether it's a mental health crisis, whether it's a substance use crisis, um, it's really brave and it's really difficult to admit that you're in a position that is tenuous enough that you need help. Now, if you've got to go to an emergency room, a regular traditional emergency room in a hospital, that can be really awful because you are sitting in that emergency room, a busy, really sort of um, frenetic emergency room with other people who are there for a variety of medical issues. Um, and you're sitting there and you're waiting because Let's face it, if you're next to somebody who's suffering a heart attack, maybe your mental health emergency, as much as it's an emergency for you, isn't really gonna be seen as, as, as emergent to those medical professionals as the person sitting next to you. Or, you know, conversely, if you're going to a mental health emergency room, you're sitting with a variety of different people and they're triaging who needs to be seen first based on the mental health emergency. Um, and sometimes, you know, in a lot of cases, and I'm certain that a lot of you have probably seen this with some of the people that you work with, you've sent people in your work to an emergency room for a mental health issue, 12 hours later, they're back on the street, right? And I know right now some of you are shaking your heads going, oh my God, that just happened yesterday, because I know it happened to me. So why BH Link is different is all we do is behavioral health. All we see are people for behavioral health issues. We are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. People can walk into our center and it is so different than a normal emergency room. Um, we're small, 
we are in an office park, so it's very unassuming. Um, when you walk into our building, it's different because we're completely voluntary. So people aren't coming to us because they've been traditionally certed to an emergency room is the term that we've used in the past. And then we still use today. Um, the doors are locked coming in, but they're not locked going out. So if you've come to us and you've decided, you know what, this isn't for me, we're going to try to encourage you to stay to get the help you need but we're not gonna force you to stay. So you can leave if you want to. And our center looks very different from other emergency rooms. It's quiet, it's dimly lit. Sometimes we have aromatherapy going, we have quiet music. Everybody has their own individual room that they can go into. Um, and the work begins the minute people come in the door. You are met immediately by a peer. I will tell people <clears throat> that the most important person that you're going to meet is the peer. Peers are people that have a shared experience. So it could be somebody that has um, you know, a mental health issue and they are now a certified peer. It could be somebody that had a behavioral health issue and now they're a certified peer, but that peer is gonna meet you and ask you what you're there for. What's going on? What brought you to our center? You're gonna be brought into one of the bays um, during, you know, now during COVID, everybody's been screened for COVID, um, temperature checked and, you know, screened with all of those traditional COVID type questions. Um, we're going to screen people for any kind of medical issues that might preclude them from going um, maybe to a hospital setting. And I'll sort of get to our APS clients in a couple minutes um, to sort of understand the differences between why a senior client might not come to us. Um, but um, once somebody has been medically cleared to stay with us, <clears throat> excuse me, they're then going to go into one of our triage units, into one of the quiet rooms, and then they're going to meet with a clinician. We have licensed mental health counselors. We have licensed clinical social workers, and that social worker is going to sit with you and do a full-scale psychosocial. Um, they're going to ask you what you're there for, and we are truly working on person-centered care. So we want to know where you are and meet you where you're at. We want to know what your goals are. We want to know where you've been and where you want to go. For some people, their next best level of care is going to be a hospitalization. Some people truly do need to be hospitalized. We're going to work to get you that hospitalization. Some people might need medication management. We're going to work with that. Some people might want to be induced for medicated assisted treatment. We're going to work with that. Some people might want peer recovery. We'll work with that. Some people might just want to start um, seeing a psychiatrist or a counselor. We'll work with that. We're going to do whatever we need to do to get you to your next best level of care without judgment and without any kind of force. We want to make sure that you have that next best level of care. We provide transportation to our center. So we have several vans <clears throat> and we can make sure that you come to us and we can make sure that you get to your next, as you see here, post-stabilization service. Um, people can come to us walk-ins. People can have a friend bring them. We can have um, an ambulance bring you. Police can bring you. We have ambulance contracts. So people can come a variety of ways. Um, we also have a couple other programs that we work with. Our, um, we have a 24-hour call center. So sometimes people don't want to actually come to our triage center. They might want to make a phone call first. So our call center <clears throat> has people answering the phones 24-7. We also answer the National Suicide Hotline. <clears throat> so for those of you that are familiar with the National Suicide Hotline, our center answers all of the calls that come into our state. So anyone that's calling the National Suicide Hotline from a Rhode Island number will be answered at our BH Link call center. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're really super proud because we were recently recognized by the National Suicide Hotline as having the highest call answer rate in the nation. So we joke around a lot in Rhode Island that we really kind of end up being last for a lot of things, but we were first for this and we're really very proud of that. And then the other line that we answer is the recovery house um, hotline. It's called 942 STOP. And it's a statewide grant program that for people that are looking to get into sober housing, um, they can actually call our 942 STOP hotline and we will connect them with the sober housing grant. It provides um, funding up to a year for people that are looking to get into recovery housing. 
So we're really excited about that option. Um, and my grant, I'm going to discuss a little bit further on in the slides, is through the Office of Healthy Aging. And I work with people that are 60 and older in getting them the services that they need um, through our center and through other organizations as well. Um, so we're really very proud of all of the work that we do. We also have mobile clinicians that go out into the community and meet with people. So as I mentioned, we're completely voluntary, but we also do have the ability to cert people if we need to. <clears throat> we're going to want to try to make sure that people buy into the idea of getting the help. But if people are a danger to themselves or others, we're going to make sure that they get the help that they need because we don't want them to be in an unsafe situation. And the only people that would not be able to stay with us would be people that are physically violent, either to themselves or to others, or people that are medically compromised. Next slide, please. So why did the state decide that BH Link was a good idea? So emergency departments really aren't a great idea for anyone for a number of reasons. One, um, the cost is tremendous. Anybody that's ever gotten an itemized bill for an emergency room knows exactly how expensive it is. We've all heard the stories about the $25 aspirin, the x-rays, all of that. It's just not a great setting for somebody that's in a behavioral health crisis for a number of reasons. One, it's just not a good setting. And two, it's not a good way to tease out what your issues are. When you're going to a traditional emergency room, you know, a lot of times they're really looking for your medical issues. And those staff really aren't trained specifically in behavioral health issues. Um, you know, some of the other issues we have, the law enforcement and first responders, they want to be helpful, but they don't always have the access or the education to really be able to know how to help people. So their first initial reaction would be to bring somebody to an emergency room but that isn't always gonna be the best option. And in a lot of ways, that only ends up exacerbating somebody's situation. And then access isn't always great because it's just not an appropriate level of care for people. So we treat people who are 18 plus. Um, in Rhode Island, we have another program for kids that are under 18. Um, we help to fill the gaps of our current crisis in emergency care um, and with emergency behavioral health. We're working to strengthen the state's response to the opioid crisis. Um, and we're trying to offer appropriate care for people that are having behavioral health crisis. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, what's a behavioral health crisis, Stephanie? Well, what we believe at BH Link is that no one's, there's no one behavioral health crisis. My behavioral health crisis might be that I'm actively suicidal. I have a plan and I'm ready to act on it. Your behavioral health crisis, or maybe your client's behavioral health crisis, might be that they are, you know, an older um, client whose spouse just died, and they're grieving, and they're really debilitated by that grief, and they don't know where to turn. They need grief counseling. Maybe it's a client that you're working with, and they just had to sell their home, and for the first time in their life, they're looking at having to move into a congregate care setting, and they're really grieving that loss. So. We don't want to quantify what a crisis is. We just want to meet people where they are and try to help them and their families to find that next best level of care. Next slide, please. So as we're talking about some of the challenges um, and how a program like BH Link addresses the current systemic challenges, I don't think it's any secret or um, I'm shocking any of you to say that behavioral health care really has challenges nationwide. Um, emergency room visits are costly and they're not always appropriate care, particularly for the seniors that we work with. I think the last place anybody wants to be in emergency room is an emergency room, but particularly when we're dealing with our seniors or particularly when we're dealing with our seniors that have any kind of mental health issues or any kind of related dementia issues, the, the really just sort of loud, noisy, bright area of an emergency room is the last place that that particular client needs to be. We talked a little bit about how law enforcement and first responders want to help individuals, but they don't always have the tools. And obviously, we all know that access to treatment is difficult. Um, so our hotline and our triage center is really working to connect people with treatment and recovery resources for not only to be cost effective, but to also get people the treatment they need. Um, 
Okay, can we have the next slide? So this is what the center looks like. As you can see, this is the back of our center. Um, it's very unassuming. If, if you drove by it, you wouldn't even know it's there. We have a small little sign on the outside. Um, you know, a couple of people have said to us, why don't you have better signage? Well, because we don't want to have a big giant sign that says, hey, we're a mental health clinic, right? There's enough stigma going on right now behind mental health. I'm sure, I'm hopeful that most of you know that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So I've been blowing up my social media and BH Link has been blowing up our social media, talking a lot about how we're trying really hard to break the stigma. Um, and so we want to create a better experience for our clients. And that's why having this particular facility um, has really helped us in trying to break that stigma because it doesn't have a big giant sign outside that says, come get behavioral health. In fact, even our name BH Link, you know, BH does imply behavioral health, but we're not called behavioral health link. It's just BH Link because we want people to understand we're trying to link you with the care that you need. Next slide, please. So when we talk about who are the behavioral health care visitors, um, it's something that I found that's very interesting. So you can see here, and these numbers are, you know, these, these numbers are a little bit older um, because we're trying to collect some data, but now that we're here, um, you know, in the time of COVID, um, it's been a little difficult to really sort of aggregate all of our data. Um, but this right here, you can see what we're looking at. And these are the people that are going into um, behavioral health emergency room visits. The thing that I found that's most interesting is for that our seniors, for our clients that are 60 and older, what I found most remarkable, but it's probably not shocking to any of you, is that the majority of people that were um, going into our behavioral healthcare settings were not going into these settings for any type of actual mental health diagnosis. They were going for substance use disorders. And they weren't just going for alcohol, they were going for opiate use. Now, I worked at a nursing home and I always found it interesting because I can't tell you how many clients I had that had true opiate addictions. And I'm guaranteeing you that some of you are shaking your heads right now. Um, doctors, for some reason, think nothing of prescribing 80-year-old women massive amounts of opiates. And I understand very clearly that there are some people that do truly suffer from chronic pain. And they need help, right? We need to treat people's chronic pain. And so these medications for many people do help them. But how many people do we know that abuse these medications? And they abuse them in the name of treating their pain. And how many doctors are just so quick to be able to write these prescriptions without really taking some time to get to know their patients and really discuss with them some other options that might be better options to pain management other than write, writing these opiate prescriptions for our older clients. And that even goes with talking about mental health issues. Um, I think it's interesting to be able to talk about that um, with our mental health patients in people that are 60 and older. How many of us have talked to our clients on protective service? Sorry, that's my, that's my dog taking a little drink right now if you're hearing some slobbering. Um, how many of us have talked to our protective service clients you know, who've talked to us about wanting to try to find um, you know, a counselor wanting to try to find a psychiatrist, and they'll say, I don't want to talk to my doctor. I don't think my doctor is going to understand that. You know, doctors, unfortunately, are really poorly equipped with the ability to know how to talk about these services for their clients. Um, I think they want to, they mean well, but they just don't have the ability to, to be able to do that. Um, and so it's interesting when I talk to so many of you out in the community because you're faced with the same issues. And that's one of the things that I found that's been so wonderful with BH Link is because all we do at our particular center is behavioral health care, our clinicians and our case managers have really been able to hone in on the fact that um, we can look for uh, different clinicians, different psychiatrists, different counselors that take insurances that our clients have. 
Um, it's hard to find that sometimes, you know, I'm sure many of you have had situations where you've got a client that's got Medicare. Where do we find a psychiatrist for someone that has Medicare? Where do we find a counselor? Um, but we're really fortunate in that our particular um, case managers, all they do is behavioral health, as opposed to going to a traditional emergency room. Sometimes, you know, they don't have that at their fingertips. So we're really fortunate. So in looking at, um, you know, what we're seeing here, depression and anxiety are the most common diagnoses. You know, I think when we talk about behavioral health and mental health, people tend to have a picture in their head of what a mental health disorder is. And unfortunately, that picture ends up being like the big diagnosis, like you see at the end, right? Schizoaffective, schizophrenia. People have this idea that a mental health issue looks like something, but it doesn't. It looks like you and me. It looks like anybody that we know. It could look like your grandma. It could look like your best friend. Um, mental health issues don't have a picture. They don't have a face. And as we see here, depression and anxiety are truly currently in our society today, the most common mental health diagnoses right now. And I think unfortunately what we're seeing is that people aren't, because they're not the big, the big ones, right? Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, people are so easy to say, well, it's not that bad well, it's only this or it's only that. So that's not true. Some people need help for those issues. Some people need medication. The only way that we're going to be able to get rid of the stigma is to really start talking about it. Could I have the next slide, please? So as we look here, this is the traditional community crisis flow, right? We have all of these people that somehow end up at the hospital ED. And then once they're leaving this hospital ED, these are the different places they go, up, they go. And I think we here, if you look at on the right side where you see services declined, those are our APS clients, right? How many times have we seen, we refer one of our APS clients to a hospital, to an ED, right? And we get excited about it, right? We finally visited them, we get a clinician who starts them. We think, finally, we're getting them to the hospital. And then we get the phone call from the discharge planner. Hopefully, I'm gonna say seven times out of 10, nobody ever calls us. We just find out from somebody that they ended up back home. And all the services that we were hoping were going to be completed were declined. So now we're left with this APS client who we were really hoping was gonna get some type of continuum of care that we were working on and they've declined the services. So now we're still stuck with homelessness, unemployment, the mental trauma, social isolation, which has been a huge issue this year, as we all know. And now they're just stuck in that cycle of APS, right? How many of us have those, I hate the term, but for lack of a better term, you're saying it right now, the frequent flyers, the people that we know are gonna show up on our caseloads once a month, every six weeks, every couple of months, they keep showing up. So let me tell you a little bit about what my grant is, um, and that's gonna be in the next couple of slides as well. Um, so my grant is through the Office of Healthy Aging. So our Office of Healthy Aging is our, um, a division of Elderly Affairs. And so what my grant is through the Office of Healthy Aging and along with BH Link, so I work with people who are 60 and older. And part of, I think, the original intention behind this grant was to bring people into our center. So the hope, I think, originally was that people who were suffering from mental health issues were going to come into BH Link and were going to be seen by clinicians and were going to get services. But I think all of us that are here today all know pretty well that people who we work with in APS really don't want to go and get treatment. The people that we work with in protective service are not the people who are really self-motivated to want to say, I need help. So what a lot of what my um, program has become has actually been threefold. So our call center will actually get phone calls from 
from seniors. Um, and it will be seniors who are struggling with mental health issues, who are struggling with issues of homelessness, who are struggling with a variety of issues. You know, today I got a phone call from a woman who is um, on disability. She's been couch surfing, staying with some friends. The most recent friend that she has been staying with for the last month is losing her apartment. And now this particular woman is going to be homeless at the end of the month. So, um, you know, even though she doesn't have any mental health issues, someone gave her my name because I work through the Office of Healthy Aging to try to see what I could do to help her um, because she called the H link and said, I don't know who else to call. So that's the first piece of what my role is, is to work with these clients that will call BH Link um, that are looking for help with mental health, either at our center or that call into our call center. The second piece of what I do is I work with our state's protective service case managers. So um, our protective service case managers in Rhode Island are all contracted through um, community action agencies. Um, I'm guessing that it's similar throughout the country and I visit with all of those groups and um, you know, make sure that they know that I'm available. I'm not going to exactly um, triage their cases from the onset once they get those cases, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to help them when they've sort of done everything that they feel that they can do and they've sort of come to that round circle of doing everything and they're at their end of their rope and they need some extra help. They'll give me a call and I will help them to triage those really tough cases with clients who have some pretty profound and severe mental health issues. Um, I've gone on home visits with them before, so I'll actually go out into the community with them. Um, so I don't exactly have a caseload, but I sometimes have a little bit of a caseload because I do help the protective service case managers in the community with managing their cases. Um, the other piece of what I do is I go out into the community to senior centers, I speak to assisted livings, to nursing homes, to doctor's offices, to home care agencies, to talk to them about BH Link and why we're a better alternative to sending clients who are 60 and older to an emergency room. Because I'm pretty certain that every single one of you have had a situation, like I mentioned before, where you've had a client who has needed to go to an emergency room and that issue has been really unsuccessful. And it's a huge frustration of all of ours because at the end of the day, we're not looking to pass on our problems or our problem child client onto someone else, right? We just are hoping that that's going to be an outlet to be able to get that client the care they need, right? How many of us have had a client that has really been very difficult, has not been successful in the community, not taking care of themselves, self-neglecting for whatever reason, probably because of an undiagnosed mental health issue, non-compliance with medication, a host of issues. They get sent to an emergency room, they get sent to a nursing home, and we think, it's like the sky's opened up and this is gonna be the answer to everything because finally they're gonna get placed somewhere and then we get the letter from the ombudsman and they're going home. And it's like, oh God, I finally thought this was gonna be the answer. And again, it is not at all because we're looking to take our problems and put them on somewhere else or because we wanna take our caseload and shorten our caseload. It's truly, truly because we want what's best for these clients and generally, it's truly because these clients have really severe and profound mental illness. And unfortunately, for so many people that are in protective service, we don't have the ability to get what they need, right? We don't have the ability to say, I'm going to get you that, um, you know, that mental health help that you need. So that's why my role has been so wonderful here in Rhode Island. And that's why I'm so proud of the fact that our Office of Healthy Aging um, and our state was able to come up with the funds to be able to support this grant through BH Link um, because I've been able to get out into the community and talk to so many providers and so many case managers like yourself about the importance of digging a little bit deeper and looking at the needs of the clients when it's come to mental health issues. 
Um, so the other piece of what I do, and it's my favorite piece of what I do, and it's been so hard not being able to do it during COVID, I go out into senior centers and to community events, and I actually speak with seniors about mental health and behavioral health. So I'm not a clinician, I'm bachelor's level um, for, for psychology and social work, but I've been doing this a long time. So I've picked up a lot of knowledge along the way. And when I go out to the senior centers, I basically just sit and I talk with the seniors about demystifying what mental health is. And I've had some wonderful sessions with them at some high rises, at some senior centers, and at some community um, centers to talk with them about, I basically just start my conversations. When I say behavioral health, what do you think of? And I get a whole bunch of silence. And I'll say, anybody remember having that aunt that people at family dinners would say, we don't want to talk to her. And someone inevitably would say, oh my God, I had that aunt. Everybody just said she was crazy. And it would spur a conversation what do you think really was the situation with that aunt? And somebody inevitably would say, you know, we had an uncle and we knew he always drank too much, but we never knew why. And then years later, I found out X, Y, Z about what happened to that uncle. And I can't tell you the wonderful conversations I've had with these seniors who've really started to learn to unpeel the layers about what mental health and behavioral health really is and how it has really helped them to understand a little bit more about their own behavioral health and mental health. Um, I've been able to work with a few groups of grandparents who are helping to take care of grandchildren who have unfortunately been, um, you know, the grandparents who are taking care of grandchildren because of the opiate crisis. We're seeing a lot of that right now. And I'm certain that maybe you're even helping some of these clients in your APS work navigate the system of you know older people who are now left with taking care of grandchildren who never really thought that they'd be in this position right now so as we're looking at all of these things i'm so thankful to be able to have this program and i can only hope that this will grow um you know throughout other states as well can we have the next slide please um somebody asked me recently do you think you've saved lives at bh link and I include this slide um, because this was an actual email that we received. Um, I know we've saved lives. Um, I know I've helped people in the work that I've done with the seniors that I work with. Um, we had recently, um, just before COVID, here in Rhode Island, all of our major networks, um, local, local TV networks, as well as our PB net, PBS networks, um, so we had seven stations simultaneously broadcast a show called It's Okay Not to Be Okay. And it was all about BH Link and all about mental health. And it was during May. So it was May of 2019. I don't know. I've lost track of time. I think lately when I talk about last year, I don't mean 2020 ever. I just mean 2019 because I feel like 2020 wasn't even a year. <laughs> um, but it was all about behavioral health and breaking the stigma. And we had one woman who was a client of ours at BH Link early on um, during when we first opened. And she was um, a middle-aged mom um, living in the suburbs. She had a job, she had kids, she was a member of the PTO. She had a group of friends, just like all of us. And she um, was an alcoholic and she was suffering with severe depression and she had suicidal ideation and she had plans to end her life. Um, and her husband didn't know what to do. And he reached out and brought her to the hospital and thought that solved the issue and it didn't. And she came home and nothing really was helping. And then he did a Google search and he found BH Link. And he took her to BH Link and we um, got her hooked up with services. So um, she has told everybody who will listen that we saved her life. So I know we're saving lives. Um, I know that the work that I'm doing through the Office of Healthy Aging is making a difference. I've had case managers tell me how thankful they are that I've been able to shed light on the fact that a lot of the work that they're doing really is affected by behavioral health crisis and by the lack of access that seniors unfortunately face in getting help. Um, not only because they don't want to have it, but also because they can't always access it because of insurance issues and things like that. 
Um, so I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing the work grow. Next slide, please. Um, so this is where um, I come to the things that, that I'm actually doing. Um, you know, it's funny, they allowed me to create my own title. And here um, in Rhode Island, a couple of years ago, we have a new director of Division of Elderly Affairs. And the first thing that she did was she changed the name. So she changed it to the Office of Healthy Aging. And I am um, creeping up on 50. So I'll be getting that AARP card soon enough. And, um, you know, I laugh all the time and I'm like, I don't want to be a senior. I don't want to be elderly. I know I'm older. Healthy aging. I, I like the term healthy aging. So, you know, they wanted me to be have the li liaison in my title because that is what I do. I'm a liaison between providers, between seniors, between APS workers. So I wanted it to reflect the Office of Healthy Aging. And I really feel that it's it's meaningful. Um, you know, I try not to get too caught up between all of the terms out there, but I think that if we can empower older people to realize that aging in place is wonderful and growing older is healthy, that we can sort of end some of the stigma around aging. So that's how I chose the title. Um, so what I do is I, um, I help seniors provide triage services at VH Link. Um, I provide support for adult protective service case managers that work with our Office of Healthy Aging. I provide support for community providers such as senior centers, nursing homes, assisted livings, doctors, even police officers. So all of our um, communities have um, police advocates and quite often I will have senior police advocates contact me via phone or email. Um, you know, sometimes they're working with a case manager, but quite often they'll just contact me apart from the case manager because they need some assistance on, you know, boots on the ground. They had to do a wellness visit. What can I do? How can I help this particular um, older person that I'm working with? I did a home visit and I'm concerned. Can you send out a mobile clinician? Can't tell you how many times I've done that. The value of our mobile clinicians has been amazing and I hope all of your communities have access to mobile clinicians because I really feel that that is where the future is headed for mental health and behavioral health services, both for, for older people, for, you know, for younger people, even for kids. Um, I think being able to go to people where they are is going to help people get better access is going to help end stigma and is really going to help be able to get people the care they need exactly when and where they need it. So I've been so grateful and I know our police officers and our communities have been so thankful to be able to have mobile clinicians that can actually go out on the spot and sometimes go with them. Um, you know, I can't tell you how wonderful it's been for older adults and their families to be able to have connections both with our case managers and with my particular office to be able to not feel like they're alone in being able to help their family members. Um, being a child of, of, of an older person that's lived a life with Mental illness is a really difficult thing, whether it's somebody that's an adult child of an alcoholic or someone that's an adult child of someone that has just lived a life of mental illness is really tough, particularly when they're aging in place. And now not only are they left with having to pick up the pieces of having you know, lived a life with this person who's been so severely mentally ill, but now this person is in a weakened state and you know, that's my mom and I've got to take care of her. Or that's my dad. And I understand, you know, he's had these weaknesses, but I have to help him. How can I help him? Being able to help people has been really empowering. And I'm really glad to be able to have this position and our center to be able to do that. Um, and again, the best part of what I do is being able to offer these presentations and help demystify behavioral health for seniors. And really, when I can make that click with a senior, that it's okay to talk about behavioral health and it's okay to talk about their mental health, I can't tell you how wonderful it is um, because I'm somebody that suffered depression. I'm someone that's, um, you know, was in a, um, a day program after suffering from um, postpartum depression with one of my children. So um, I talk about it and I feel like it's empowering for me. 
So when I can see other people, particularly our older um, clients, be able to be honest and share their stories too, it's so amazing. And I feel so wonderful about them being empowered to be able to do that. Next slide. So adult protective service, cases we see, way we, ways we can help our clients. Um, I cannot think that there's anyone that's on this call. It's looking like there's 193 of you. So thanks everybody for sticking with me for 46 minutes. Um, I can't imagine that there isn't one of you that's here right now that hasn't dealt with someone that hasn't had some type of mental illness. Now I'm gonna guarantee that a bulk of the people have been clients that have had undiagnosed mental illness. So you're out there, you're working with this client that you know has something and there's no name to it. They won't admit it. Maybe you even talked to their general practitioner and the general practitioner doesn't want to admit it, but you know it, right? Because this is what you do. Um, how do you help that client? What can you do to help that client? It's not an easy thing. Um, and it can also be a difficult thing to navigate, <laughs> a difficult um, position for you to be in. So the best thing that I would say is to start off slow and to start off easy and to um, you know be gentle. You certainly don't want to jump into it, particularly with an unwilling client by you know saying, you need a psychiatrist even if that is exactly what the person needs. But sometimes even if it's a client who's at least willing to listen, sometimes even saying, hey, have you considered that it might not be a bad idea to talk to somebody about the way you're feeling? Here, I've got some brochures. Even if you're not certain, a quick Google search on your local mental health clinics are gonna give you everything you need, are gonna have stuff at your fingertips. I'm going to guarantee that most of you have community resources and have connections with your local community mental health clinics. Maybe even reaching out to them and having them, you know, trying to find a partnership with them if you don't have that already. Um, you know, to be able to figure out a way to have somebody at your fingertips. It's one thing that I always recommend to all of my case managers is to have a little bit of a toolbox. Um, to have a toolbox of a couple phone numbers, a couple people, you know, remember that one discharge planner at the hospital that finally answered your phone call? Never lose that phone number. Even if that discharge planner rolls their eyes every time you call, never lose that phone number ever because that's your go-to person. Um, you know, the community mental health worker that maybe is outside of the catchment area of the client that you live in, do not lose that phone number because that community mental health worker is going to know another community mental health worker for the catchment area of that client that you're working with. So it's really important to have a toolbox to be able to um, help clients navigate these issues when it comes to mental health because nine times out of 10, the things that are bringing these clients to self-neglect are probably mental health issues. You know, the abuse end of it is a completely different aspect. And sometimes, you know, a client can, um, can, can find themselves in an abusive situation or in an abuse situation because of some mental health issues, either from the abuser or because of their own mental health issues. But that ends up becoming a whole different issue. But particularly in your self-neglect cases, a lot of those cases um, do end up being a direct result of some type of mental health issue. So, you know, like I said, if you can have a toolbox um, you know, if you can, if you can work with that general practitioner to say, listen, I'm a professional, stand up for yourself. Even if you are just a bachelor level, even if you, if even if you don't have a degree, I know our particular case managers here in Rhode Island, most of the, most of the case managers have to have at least a bachelor's. I don't know where you guys are across the country and where you live. Um, but even if you don't, stand up for yourself. You are an adult protective case manager. You are a professional. So do not ever let anybody demean you, whether they're a doctor, a licensed clinician, you're a professional in your own right. And make sure that you honor that and make sure that you let other people that you're working with know that. Because at the end of the day, you're working in the best interest of the client. 
um, and you know, have that toolbox together to do whatever you have to do to be able to help that client in the best way you can. Next slide. Questions. So I have spent the better part of 49 minutes talking. Well, not really, because Leslie and, and Andrew spoke a little bit. I don't think Leslie thought I could talk this long. <laughs> Well, thank you, Stephanie. I think that was really helpful <laughs> info. And you were mentioning Toolbox. Um, I put a, a link in the chat for our attendees. The uh, APS Turk just recently published a toolkit on mental health, and you've got the link there in chat if you'd like to look at that. Of course, it's from a national level, so it won't have local resources, but it's a good place to get you started. So FYI, it's a good place to, to check that out. I thought I would mention that. Um, we do have a few questions, Stephanie. Um, sure. So I'll launch right into those. We've got a, a few minutes left. Um, the, the first one is, is BH Link only available to Rhode Island residents? So currently um, we, we can see, let's put it this way, in Rhode Island, if anybody comes into BH Link, we'll see them. Um, we don't take, we don't charge anybody for our services. If someone has insurance, we may bill their insurance for like the clinicians or the peers, those services. Um, and right now we're only going to be billing for Rhode Island insurances. Um, but we're certainly not going to say no to anybody. The issue would become that next level of service. So let's say you were nearby Massachusetts, we might have some difficulty placing you um, depending upon what your insurance was, or say you had Connecticut insurance or you know, New Hampshire, we might have trouble getting you to your next level of care based on what your insurance was. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to say only for Rhode Island residents. We wouldn't say no to anybody, but it might be difficult for us to to get you to where you need to be. Sure, sure. Makes perfect sense. Um, okay, and our next one, this one's a little bit long, so I'll read it twice. Many, okay. of, many of our cases involve mental health crisis of an adult child or the senior resulting in emotional and physical abuse of the senior. How does your program deal with these situations? So again, many of our cases involve a mental health crisis as a result of emotional and physical abuse of a senior. How does your program deal with these situations? Right. So honestly, any, any cases that come my way are first triaged by the APS worker that's assigned to the case. So I don't have an actual case load. No case is gonna, sorry about that, that's Tessie. She's trying to answer. Um, no case is gonna be assigned to me first directly. So if I had a case um, that was coming to me, say I was working whoever the, the um, you know, person that was asking that, um, if you came to me and, and you had an issue where let's say the, the, person, the person was being ab abused by an adult child yeah. who had a mental health issue, I would try to figure out a way to help that client navigate a way to get some help for their adult child. If it sure. was the client themselves that had the mental health issue, we'd try to figure out a way to get that client the, the mental health help they needed. Um, but it would all start on my level with the APS worker because I'm not directly assigned the cases. But we sure. would just work the best way we could. And you know, if it was a situation where it was an emergent situation, and we needed to either, you know, separate that client from the abuser, then we would do what we had to do within our Office of Healthy Aging and the Attorney General's office to make that happen. Great. That's a great answer. Um, and that kind of feeds into the one of the other questions we got. Any tips for convincing clients to accept mental health services? <laughs> Again, that's yeah, that's a big one. So getting clients to accept mental health services, any tips you have? So one of the things that I've always used in my toolbox is I've always tried to, to, to convince my clients to get help by telling them that by helping themselves, they're going to be helping their families, right? That's always been one way that I, you know, I've said, even like, let's say like the home care issue, right? You've got that client yeah. who's like, I don't want anybody to come into my home. Yeah, right. but you know what, Mary, by you getting the help you need, you're going to be helping your daughter take better care of you. So that's always been one approach, um, you know, with the mental health issue. And even in some cases, when it's like that true mental health, I'll open up about myself. You know, I'll say, listen, I know it's a tough subject. I see a counselor. I take some medication. I'm not ashamed of it. 
I know it's something I need. So sometimes if you can make a personal connection, mm -hmm. um, if you know a story about someone or it's about yourself, sometimes that can be really helpful. And that can just be the door that you need to slightly open. Sometimes, you know, the first thing you have to do, particularly if it's a brand new case, you've got to build trust. So you right. see this client first time, don't think you're going to be able to make that connection on that first visit. You might have to go back a couple times because the first thing you need to do before you're going to get that buy-in is building trust. Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another question that just rolled in, how does your organization deal with clients who have no official diagnosis? Wow, that, that's always tough. And that's a lot of our clients. Um, so, you know, we will, um, you know, try to um, see what we can do to at least, you know, get them to a psychiatrist um, to see if we can get that workup done. So long as they're willing to go, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then and then then if they won't, you know, we'll we'll at least maybe work with a general practitioner to maybe see if that general practitioner will give like a general diagnosis. Sure. Because unfortunately, most of the people that we work with don't have an official diagnosis, um, either because a, the general practitioner doesn't want to deal with it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that happens, or because the client is just never presented in such a way that a doctor has taken those steps. Um, so, you know, it all depends upon the situation. Yep. And uh, it certainly is common with APS clients that they yes. won't have a diagnosis. I'm sure you know that. Yep. Yep. Um, one other question that speaks to something you touched on a little bit before we started the Q&A part of the program. Um, can you describe your mobile crisis services? Sure. So we have several. We have one of our mobile crisis units is actually called our SOAR team. So it's a state grant. So much of what we do in Rhode Island is through grants that come either from SAMHSA, which is the federal mental health grant, um, or through state grants. But um, the SOAR is the state opioid response. And it started out as ways to address the state's opioid program. So it is through community mental health agencies, they go out based on location. So um, it would all be county based. Um, and a mobile clinician would go out, um, you know, they'd have the driver that would go. And it doesn't have to just be for an opiate issue now. It could be for a mental health crisis. So it could be initiated by an APS worker, might call the community mental health agency and say, hey, I've got a client. We really think that they're in a crisis. They need to be seen, potentially asserted. Could you send somebody out there? So that's one of our programs. Yeah. And then at the link, we actually have somebody who works on site. She's our mobile crisis um, clinician. And it's a very similar thing, although she doesn't necessarily, um, she's not just going out just to cert people. She'll go out just to put eyes on people and offer a number of services. So mm. she'll go out and talk to somebody she'll go out for crisis she'll go out to cert she'll go out just to give information to a client but that's all initiated either through our call center through an APS worker through myself anybody can actually call BH link and request a mobile crisis team um, and then if we have availability we'll send someone out good deal well, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, we've reached the top of the hour, so I think we should wrap awesome. things up. We really appreciate you doing this for us. I think it's very important to hear about, uh, hear from someone who's had experience with both APS and mental health. A lot of APS workers, you know, have not worked in mental health before, not had a lot of experience with mental health clients, so um, or clients with mental health so issues. So thank you so much for this information. Um, if we can go to the very last slide, you'll see some contact information for the APS TARC, where you can reach out to us. There's an email address and a web address there. Um, you know, check out our website if you haven't already. There's lots of good resources on there, including recorded webinars, about two dozen of them that we've done over the past several years. So, um, you know, take a look at those. They're a good educational opportunity. And again, thanks to Stephanie um, for, for speaking to us today. I think it was really helpful information and um, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.